What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of Shark Bites. Today's episode is venturing slightly away from what we would normally cover on the channel. We're going to have a look at a documentary that came out a few weeks ago on the BBC. It was called Why Sharks Attack and I know there's a lot of you out there that were posting in the comments that wanted to hear my thoughts about this documentary. I did actually catch the last 10 minutes or so of the program when it was on live but I've been meaning to get round to properly watching it. And I do remember when I was watching those last 10 minutes or so of the program there were a few things that were mentioned that I started to get a little bit angsty about. And because of those 10 minutes, I'd already formed an opinion on the program. So I'm actually glad that I went back and watched the whole thing. So I'm going to give you a little rundown on what the program was about, review it at the same time, and that way you can make up your minds as to whether you want to watch it or not. Normally with the BBC and their wildlife documentaries, they tend to do a pretty decent job. Sadly today though, I'm not going to be able to use any of the footage that they use in the documentary because the BBC are so on it with their copyright and would probably crush me immediately. Before I start though, if you like the idea of me doing reviews for documentaries like this, then please do give the video a like. If I can see that these videos are doing well and getting lots of views, then I'm going to do more of them. So make sure you hit that like button below. Okay, so the general premise of the show is that it's looking at shark attacks and most of them tend to be from the last few years or so. But the key thing about a lot of the attacks that feature in this program is that they were caught on film and then subsequently went viral on social media. The documentary initially frames itself around the spate of fatal attacks attacks that have occurred in the Red Sea in the last two years, i.e. Elizabeth Sauer, Roxana Donison, and Vladimir Popov. Elizabeth and Roxana were fatally mauled back in 2022, and then Vladimir was much more recently, as in like the last three months. But alongside these incidents, the show also briefly looks at other attacks in the Red Sea down the years and other attacks from around the world. The attack on Addison Bethay in Western Florida in 2022, and then also the blue shark attack on the snorkeler that was here in Cornwall where I live. And of course, I can't can't forget the infamous Simon Nellis incident near Sydney. A lot of these attacks we've covered on the channel before and there's tons of you out there that found the content that we made here on Shark Bites about them pretty interesting. So from the get-go if you're the type of person that enjoys watching and learning about shark attacks then this program is probably going to pique your interest. Looking at all of the Red Sea incidents that feature on the program visually it's really interesting. We don't get much in terms of footage of the attacks themselves we get the odd sort of side shot from certain angles but what we do get is a lot of eyewitness reports from people who were there on those days. Alongside this, we get interviews with shark attack specialists, as well as interviews with the local relevant authorities. For the Red Sea stuff, that's HEPCA, which stands for the Hagada Environmental Protection and Conservation Association. One of the things that struck me right away as being really cool was hearing from all of these eyewitness accounts that were there, and how these eyewitness accounts often differed from the official reports that were released around the incidents by the authorities. So for the Elizabeth Sand our incident, multiple eyewitnesses reported that a 10 year old girl had repeatedly tried to tell lifeguards that were on the jetty that there was a shark in the water just minutes before it attacked Elizabeth. But the lifeguards just ignored her on those multiple occasions saying that she had seen a dolphin and not a shark. Although according to the official reports that were released afterwards, after the lifeguards had been alerted to the presence of a shark, they ordered all of the swimmers out of the water. So someone isn't telling the truth here. Either it was the eyewitnesses that were saying the lifeguards ignored the 10 year old girl, or the authorities aren't telling the truth about ordering all the swimmers out of the water. The question I would get you guys to ask yourselves though is who has more to lose? Is it the random tourists who have no vested interest? Or is it the authorities who are depending on that tourism and the lifeguards who are paid to keep those tourists safe? I'll let you all make up your own minds there. At this stage in the show, we get a few discussion points as to what species of shark was responsible for the attacks. And of course, initially, all of the fingers were pointed to oceanic white tip sharks after the incidents in 2010 and 2018. There's also some good points raised about the topography of the area. I have spoken about the topography stuff before, but I'll highlight it again for anyone who missed those last few videos. The Red Sea, in terms of how it's naturally designed, has these really shallow reefs that drop off very steeply into deep water. And the jetties where these tourists swim from run out into those shallow reefs that's not too far away from that steep drop off. But because it drops off so steeply, you can go from being in water that's two to three meters deep to being in water that's 200 meters deep. And this means that those big predatory sharks, your tigers, your oceanic white tips can find themselves in real shallow water 
very easily and very quickly. We get a good few snippets of insight from shark attack specialist Ralph Collier, who's probably one of the most renowned specialists for shark-human interactions in the world. And what's really interesting here is that for at least the Roxana Donison incident, Ralph Collier describes it as a feeding event. And I find it interesting because it's probably one of the first times that I've ever seen on a documentary about sharks, a specialist refer to an attack as a feeding event, especially from a TV broadcaster as renowned as the BBC. After some more discussion about bite markings and bite radius, they show us that the attacks on Elizabeth and Roxana couldn't have been from oceanic white tips because the bite marks weren't correct. And instead they show us that they were actually from tiger sharks. What's even crazier here though, is that while they were filming the interview with Ralph Collier about the 2022 attacks on Elizabeth and Roxana, literally as they had the cameras rolling, bang, up pops on social media the attack on Vladimir Popov. It's actually mad. On the show itself, the interviewer in the background just says to Ralph, oh, we've just been sent a video of the attack that's happened today. Do you want to watch it? At which point he's just handed a mobile phone and he watches the incident unfold. That was actually a really interesting section of the TV show though. Watching a shark attack specialist react in real time to a shark attack that has literally just happened. We then get some more good information about the specific tiger shark that was responsible for killing Vladimir, the Russian tourist, and about the decisions made to remove the shark from the area. Supposedly, the tiger shark in question had stayed around the area and was swimming underneath the jetties where all the people go swimming for three hours after killing and eating Vladimir. At which point, Hepka and the other relevant local authorities made the decision to remove the shark from the area because it showed no signs of going anywhere. And so they they made the call to bring in the local fishermen and catch the shark and they caught it pretty quickly. I think it shows you that that shark had no intention of leaving that area anytime soon based on how quickly the fishermen managed to catch it. After the shark was caught, it was sent off for a necropsy by various scientists who specialize in the dissection of large marine megafauna. This is where they proved that this was the specific shark that had killed Vladimir because they found the remains inside the stomach of that shark. But it's also where they got some other super interesting information as to why that shark might have attacked and eaten Vladimir in the first place. During the dissection, the scientists noted that other than Vladimir's remains, there was nothing in that shark's stomach or intestinal tract. Usually when you're dissecting sharks, if they're happy, healthy sharks, you'll find some kind of remains in the stomach or the intestines, whether that be fish bones or crustacean shells or just a gloopy, smelly, digested mess, there's usually something in there that suggests that shark has been feeding on things. Believe me, I've had the pleasure, not quite, of dissecting lots and lots of sharks down the years, and you almost always find some form of evidence in there. Sharks generally have a really slow digestion process, and it's thought they have this because they want to try and get every last possible calorie out of the food that they've just eaten. So when they've eaten, the remains of whatever it is they've eaten stays in their stomachs and their intestines for a long time, which makes it incredibly interesting in this example with Vladimir. Because considering it didn't have anything else in its stomach or its intestines at the time that it attacked and ate Vladimir, it tells us that this shark was basically starving. It hadn't eaten any food in a long time. But this wasn't the only observation the scientists made when they were dissecting that tiger shark. Not only was the shark incredibly hungry, it was also heavily pregnant. I had someone commenting on a previous Shark Bites episode we did on this topic where they were trying to say that it was a male shark that had killed Vladimir because they could see claspers in the video where the fishermen hauled it up. I did explain to them that the necropsy report showed that it was a pregnant female and that they might have confused claspers with pelvic fins. But it's good to hear it again on this BBC program that this shark was definitely a female and was pregnant. Tiger shark embryos when they're in the womb of their mother generally are more numerous and bigger than compared to other large predatory shark species. So it's entirely possible here that the Haggadah shark attack was as a result of a heavily pregnant female that was basically starving and needing to sustain her developing young. And this could be one of the reasons that this shark decided to venture into the shallows to try and find food. Nor Farid from Hepka here for the second time on this program describes the Vladimir Popov incident as a feeding event. We get a few of the specialists then going on to mention overfishing and the impact that this might be having on sharks in the Red Sea. And there's another reference to the Sharm El Sheikh attacks in 2010 where Ralph Collier backs up that point, reminding us that the shark that was responsible for two of those attacks was extremely malnourished and emaciated. And that that individual shark had a massively decreased liver size. The liver is a super important organ for sharks because not only do they use it for buoyancy, but it's also used as an energy reserve 
serve as well. And it helps sharks survive those occasional long periods between meals. Ralph says that the sharks that were caught after the 2010 incidents had liver masses that were only about 10% of their body weight, when it should normally be 30%. He also goes on to say that every shark that he's seen come out of the Red Sea would not be a shark that he would describe as a healthy animal. Which again raises the question, is there enough food to go around for sharks in the Red Sea? If there isn't, then sharks could quite easily turn to alternative food items to survive. I've said it so many times on this channel, there are shark species out there that will eat whatever they can to survive. Oceanic white tips, tiger sharks, great whites, they all do it. Norfarid from Hepka is adamant that a commercial fishing ban and a drastic reduction in sport fishing in the area needs to be implemented immediately in the Red Sea because fish stocks there are simply so low and he feels that that's gonna be a key driver in shark attacks for the Red Sea moving into the future. The show switches over to Australia then to cover some of the information surrounding the Simon Nellist attack that happened in Little Bay not too far away from Sydney. And again, it's another one where parts of that attack were caught on film by the anglers that were on the shore. They mentioned some good points again about the topography of the area, which for Little Bay are those deep channels that run alongside those cliffs that drop off steeply into the water. And they also mentioned some stuff about the anglers that were fishing in the area. Gavin Naylor from the International Shark Attack File weighs in here. And interestingly, he says that he's not sure whether this was a predation event or not. I did have that email from Gavin confirming the reasons as to why this was classified as a provoked incident as opposed to an unprovoked incident. But it is interesting to hear him say that he's not sure whether this was a predation event or not. I personally would say that this was a predation event considering the shark was filmed coming back to feed on the remains of Simon's body after the initial attack. The show then goes on to talk about mistaken identity quite a lot here, featuring Dr. Laura Ryan's sensory research on the topic. She basically compares what sharks might be seeing from below from their visual perspective and found no major difference differences between swimmers, surfers, and seals. Previously, we've been led to believe that it was surfers that were confused as seals by sharks when referring to mistaken identity. But Laura's research is actually quite cool because it does show us that a swimmer could just as easily be confused as a seal than what a surfer might be. Again, though, it felt like they were attributing the Simon Nellis incident to mistaken identity when I personally don't think that was the case at all. I've said it before, mistaken identity does happen, but in cases of mistaken identity, the norm for the shark would be to swim off after that initial bite. But we've seen video footage of Simon Nellis's floating remains being consumed, probably by the same shark that initiated the attack. So for me, I put that down as an opportunistic feeding event. That specific shark was hungry, needed to eat, and Simon was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Throughout this section of the program though, they do make some great points about temperature and the impact that can have on the sharks. For the Simon Nellis incident, it's shown that the El Nino, or the El Nino, I forget now, whatever it was that happened that year was a key driver in bringing great white sharks closer to the shore. And that potentially combined with the anglers and a particularly opportunistic shark led to Simon sadly losing his life. There's a few more interesting bits in the program that I haven't mentioned so far. One of them's Dr. Lucy Hawks, who actually was my old university supervisor back when I was doing my undergrad. And she features quite a lot throughout the program. She's the conservation scientist on the show who explains a lot about the individual sharks and the important role that they play in the ecosystem. And then there's other tidbits of information on the blue shark attack that happened here in Cornwall and the Addison Bethay attack that happened in Western Florida back in 2022. We're also reminded at the end of the program that despite these recent spate of attacks in the Red Sea and other parts of the world seeming pretty gruesome, that shark attacks are still exceptionally rare, which is absolutely correct. So what did I make of the program then? Well, overall, I thought it was pretty interesting and very well presented. The eyewitness reports, the science and the graphics were all spot on. It was also refreshing to see people actually talking about these attacks earnestly in regards to them being opportunistic feeding events instead of sugarcoating it. I didn't really agree with the mistaken identity stuff that they framed around the Simon Nellis incident towards the end of the program. I just think there were loads of better examples that they could have used to back up their point about mistaken identity. With the reasonings for some of the attacks though, they mentioned topography, temperature, overfishing, and tourism. All four of which I spoke about extensively in the Hagada shark attack video we did here on Shark Bites the day that it happened. The only one that I mentioned that they didn't mention was the stuff about the turtle nesting season, which I suppose is quite difficult to definitively prove as a reason. And like I've said before, when incidents like this happen, they're not black and white. It's often a case of multiple factors all combining together to create the perfect 
storm that leads to fatalities. I would recommend watching this BBC show to all of you out there who are interested in the shark attack stuff that we do here on the channel. And although it didn't go into as much depth as I'd have liked on some of the factors that led to the attacks, I still found it interesting. But before you do watch it, I'd recommend watching this video right here. It's the video we did here on Shark Bites all about the Vladimir Popov incident, and it goes into a little bit more detail about those factors that I mentioned earlier. So I think you'll find it really interesting watching it alongside this BBC program. So watch it here.